Hi everyone, thanks for joining me for another video. So for this month's video I thought I would read you a story, basically, and I'll give you a little bit of like a, a precursor to it. So for our, the, the Cornwall Mystery School, when you go through that for the Priestess of Cornwall training, module two is all about the myths of this land, because if we are famous for anything, it is that. And there, there's three that I go into in depth there, but then also give you space to go and like research your own. And they all have like a deeper meaning as to what it means to be a priest or priestess of Cornwall, um, which I won't go into in this video. But my favourite one that I, I wrote was the love of Tristan and Isolde. And I, I mean, everyone, I'm sure you know this story. And if not, you're in for a ride. It's awesome. Um, but yeah, so I kind of like reimagined these stories a little bit, sometimes kept them quite close, like quite true to their, their core. Uh, but this one I kept as true, I'm pretty sure it's as true as can be, but just reworded in my words and phrases. Yeah, so if you would like to get comfortable, are we all sitting comfortably? Are we ready to have a story told to us now? <laughs> okay, The Love of Tristan and Isolde. Ever since he was a young boy, Tristan had lived with his uncle, Mark the King of Cornwall. During his youth, Tristan would squire for the king, and eventually he would train to become the most impressive knight that Cornwall had seen for centuries. People would often compare him to the great knights of the Round Table, for he captured their chivalrous outlook in all aspects of his life. One day at court, what was up until this point a very pleasant and normal day was interrupted by the ominous sound of an uninvited guest arriving at the gates of King Mark's castle. The horse's hooves thundering with every gallop, kicking up dust and anticipation in its wake. All the while getting louder and louder and closer and closer, until eventually the stranger reached the gates and slowly looked up at the guards. They shouted down to him, inquiring as to his name, or at the very least, his title. The stranger continued to stare at them for what seemed like an uncomfortable amount of time. Never blinking. His voice boomed back at them. I am the one and only Marold, the greatest swordsman in all of Ireland. Now I aim to be the greatest swordsman in all of England. For you see, I have come for your king's head for I think he quite a prize for my trophy room. What with the not-so-thinly-veiled threats, the guards would not let him enter the castle. Marold refused to leave, though, him being one to never take no for an answer. Instead, Marold waited it out, sometimes pacing quietly. At others, he would shout to the guards and taunt them, teasing them, just hoping to goad one of them into coming down and fighting him. He could afford such cocky behaviour as he knew the guards would not kill or maim him, for he had the protection of his niece, a famed healer and enchantress throughout Ireland. Before Marold had left Ireland, he asked of his niece's powers and asked for a protection spell and a poison. She crafted the spell, the most potent spell she had ever woven, and her poison was equally as powerful. The protection spell was housed in a small jar that Marold wore around his neck, for it would only protect those that it touched. So for every arrow that the guards of King Mark's castle fired at Marold, they would somehow bounce off his body, not even piercing the worn leather armour that he wore. Word quickly reached King Mark of Marold's presence and of his seemingly supernatural powers. King Mark was too old to fight these days, and especially against such magic. How was he ever expected to win? He had no heir, so if he died this day, then his kingdom would fall along with his legacy. Tristan could see the turmoil in his uncle's eyes, so he picked up his sword and asked for his uncle's permission to fight Marold in his place as his champion. As much as King Mark loved this boy, this did rather solve his conundrum, so he allowed Tristan to fight Marold as his champion. Tristan took up this chance to defend the, defend the honour of this King Mark and strode towards the gates and towards Marold himself. As he approached, he shouted to the guards to open the gate, and so the guards did as he commanded. Tristan was now face to face with the dreaded Marold. Marold, noticing that this young man was not in fact the old king he had requested, was instantly angered. And just who do you think you are, little boy, 
to come and fight me with your fancy sword is very presumptive of you. Where is the old man and his crown? Morold shouted. The king has much more important things to be doing with his time than fighting with madmen, so he sent the best man for the job, for I am Tristan, the greatest swordsman Cornwall has ever seen, replied Tristan. If I must kill a mouse to then kill the lion, then so be it, Morold boldly said as he unsheathed his sword. Both men were instantly ready to fight to the death. Tristan was quick to draw his sword, but before he could attempt to strike Morold, his arm was nicked by the blade of Morold's sword. The two danced around each other, one trying to hit the other and avoid being hit themselves. Tristan, knowing of Morold's apparently supernatural abilities, knew that the key to Morold's impenetrability must be close to hand, for no mortal could not be pierced, and the gods were not as cruel as Morold. So Tristan had to keep one eye on Morold's blade, and another on the lookout for the magical amulet that protected his attacker so. Morold was full of fancy fighting moves, and as he was spinning around to try to strike Tristan's legs, the protection spell jar revealed itself from under his shirt. Tristan noticed it immediately, and in the blink of an eye he had drawn his dagger from its belt and cut the jar from around Morold's neck. Morold could only stop and stare in disbelief as Tristan crushed the bottle in his hand and finally lunged his sword through Morold's heart. With his dying breath, Morold sneered at Tristan and told him, That scratch I gave you on your arm, boy, you'll want that seeing too. For I laced my sword with a mighty strong poison. The only antidote is to be found with my niece in Ireland. Azult is her name and to my house and land she belongs. With that, Morol died at the gates of King Mark's castle. Tristan did not hesitate to take a boat across to Ireland, the fastest in his uncle's fleet. When they landed in Ireland, he was taken to Morold's land, and there they were greeted by Isolt herself. By this point, Tristan was hazy and losing consciousness from the poison, so his men explained to Isolt what had happened. Isolt, so it seemed, was glad to hear of her uncle's death, but he was a brute to her and kept her locked on his land, so she had never seen anything other than the barren land and cold stronghold that belonged to Morold. She took great pity on the sweet man Tristan and immediately admin administered him the antidote. Tristan was then given a room to rest and heal in. It took three full days for him to fully heal and to come around. His men took great delight in telling Tristan about what had happened during the past three days. Isolt had told them about all the abuses her uncle Morold had put her through, and how her magical powers only worked upon this land, and that is why he kept her locked up so. She had stated that she did not care for her magical abilities, as they were a gift from her wicked uncle. Now he was dead, though. She had nowhere to go. The men had had a thought. They gleefully told Tristan, the king still needed an heir, and Isolt needed a place to live, so why not have them marry and conceive a child? A messenger was sent to King Mark, and he excitedly agreed that the men could bring Isolt back with them, and that the two of them would be married upon her arrival to Cornwall. Tristan was to be her escort on the boat back that very day. He was rather curious, Tristan, for he had not probably, properly met Isolt yet. But all the men spoke so highly of her, often speaking of her kindness, her beauty and her strength. After changing into clothes befitting of the occasion, Tristan was formally introduced to Isolt. And at that moment, his breath momentarily left his body when he saw her. She was as beautiful as a sunflower on a summer's morning. Her voice was as sweet as the nectar of the gods. How could he help but fall in love with such a woman? Little did he know that whilst he was falling in love with Isolt, she too was falling deeply in love with him. She had noticed his eyes first, and how the hazel colours in them deepened in the light. Isolt saw how his eyes gazed at her, and Tristan saw how her eyes gazed the same way at him. And so they knew that they were in love, a terribly doomed love. Tristan, being the man of honour that he was, tried to hide his feelings for Isolt, but a love as fierce as theirs could not be suppressed when they were together. Together, Tristan and Isolt agreed that for the boat ride they would be together, but upon their arrival they would see each other as little as possible. 
So that night on the boat, Tristan and Isolt made love so passionately that it changed them to their very core. Isolt was wedded to King Mark and lived the life of a gracious queen. She adored her husband but had no real love for him. King Mark was happy with his new bride though and allowed her many freedoms and privileges. The night that Tristan and Isolt had made love, they knew that they would have to see each other again, but there was a palpable connection between them that was hard to hide, so they would only meet under the light of the full moon once a month. This would go on for months until King Mark started to grow suspicious of their behaviour, so on the next full moon, he sent his best spy to follow the couple and witness their affair. Tristan and Isolt, being so wrapped up in each other's presence, did not notice the spy, and so the spy was witness to the couple's kisses, words of love and tender touches. The spy snuck through the darkness of the night back to the king to report his findings. King Mark was heartbroken. The love he bore for his nephew was like that of a son. And although he knew his wife did not love him, he was fond of her and thought they had a shared respect. It seemed he was mistaken, though, and this betrayal caused him a great anger. He waited until morning to seek his revenge upon the lovers. Whilst he was still sleeping, Tristan was accosted by the king's guards, yelling at him to get dressed and come with them to present himself to King Mark and face judgment for his treasonous actions. Tristan was understandably shaken and confused by this, but did as he was told as quickly as possible. Tristan was marched into the throne room to face King Mark and Queen Isolt. Isolt herself had little knowledge of what was happening, for her husband had only told her to present herself in court for her surprise. When she saw Tristan being thrown to the floor in front of her throne, she screamed and she cried, for she knew that they had been found out and that the price to pay for treason is death. Tristan knew as much as well, and had resigned himself to his fate. Death was a worthy price to pay for all the love, for all the months of love and passion Isolt had given him. King Mark confirmed Isolt's worries when, the, when he told the court about Tristan and Isolt's affair. He exclaimed quite loudly about the betrayal and the treason from the two people he loved the most. Eventually, after his anger had run its course, King Mark declared that Tristan was to be executed by beheading, and that it was to happen right now and in this very throne room. Tristan was pushed to his knees before his queen, the woman he loved so very much, and just before the executioner's sword touched his throat, he said to her, I will love you even beyond death, and in death is where she, we shall find, find each other again. With that, the executioner gave his blow, and Tristan was no more. Isolt screamed and cried and tried to look away, but King Mark forced her to look at the body of her lover. He told her how he would have mercy on her, and how he would let her live, for the pain that Tristan's grisly death causes is punishment enough. King Mark was right. The pain, the grief, and the now empty part of her was too much to bear. She cried non-stop for 30 days. On the 31st day, she did not cry, nor did she even speak. On that night, the night of the full moon, she walked towards the cliff edge and gazed, gazed out to sea. She let herself fall into the sea beneath her, allowing its strength to reunite her with her beloved Tristan. In the morning, her body was found by a local fisherman who brought her back to King Mark. King Mark could see the pain he had caused his queen and his nephew. He sobbed out all of his anger until there was nothing left but pity and guilt. He had his old buried next to Tristan, just as married couples are. From both of their graves grew two separate rose bushes. Tristan's grave sprouted white roses, and from his old red roses bloomed. The two bushes intertwined and created the pink rose. And so Tristan and Isolt were together again, peacefully and as madly in love as they were in life. The end. <laughs> so I hope you all enjoyed that. And apologies if my speaking voice is a little bit rough. I've been ill for the past week and I'm tired, a little bit groggy, but hopefully that did the job for you. <laughs> all right, I hope you enjoyed yourself, guys, and I will see you next month. Bye.